the devil remembers. This is something the prophet Zechariah knew. The children of Israel had gone from Babylon back to their land and they had built their temple, but they weren't doing so great. That sets the scene for this vision. Now in your imagination, I want you to close your eyes and go into a vision with Zechariah the prophet. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Verse 3 is the reason why the devil was accusing Joshua. You see, the high priest was never supposed to wear dirty clothes. Joshua being mentioned here is not Joshua, the leader of Israel into the conquest of Canaan. But this is Joshua, the high priest, after Babylon captivity. So you see, Zechariah saw him standing before God in dirty garments, and Satan was standing there also, pointing at Joshua, saying to God, look at him, look at him, look at your children. The children of Israel have sinned. You are a holy God. You cannot tolerate sin, destroy them, condemn them. The theme of the vision of the prophet Zechariah is that the devil is an accuser who has taken up the ministry of accusations against the believers. The devil is a specialist in accusing you and also making it look like God is in agreement with his accusations. He knows our failures. He knows when we commit sin against God. He knows when we take the wrong step or act the wrong way. So he comes to the court of heaven to present our cases before God and to tell him why we are unworthy of his blessings. The devil knows the standards that God has set for us, his children. Therefore, he will always lie in wait for us to transgress God's law so that his case will be presentable to God. You see, the enemy is very strategical. He will tempt you with sin and he will throw fiery darts at you and say to you, come on, just commit that sin. God will forgive you. God is a forgiving God. You know you want to. Then once you succumb to the temptation of that sin and you commit that sin, now he changes his tactics and begins to make you feel guilty. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You really shouldn't have done that. You are too sinful to pray. You can't go to church after what you did. God won't listen to your prayers and he tries to make you feel guilty. So initially he entices you and then later on he begins to try to make you feel guilty. He is the accuser of the brethren. Have you ever felt Satan's accusations against you? Have you ever been alone? reading the Bible and just like Ezekiel says you will look back on all the ways you defiled yourself and will hate yourself because of the evil you have done and you kick yourself saying why did I do that but the fact is that happened years ago but the devil remembers what you did the devil remembers the devil will not only accuse you to God he will accuse you to yourself, sins that God has forgiven you for years ago. But the devil remembers them and he will continue to throw the fiery darts of accusation against you. Believers should know that the devil watches every one of their deeds. You may forget a sin that you have committed. You may forget that you have committed a particular sin, but you need to know that the devil remembers. Every sin we commit is another fiery instrument of accusation for him. He uses God's holiness 
as the basis of his argument against us before God. And when he accuses us to ourselves, he uses guilt and condemnation against us. You will be trying to pray and the devil will bring to your memory the sin you have committed years ago. Making you feel bad and unworthy to pray. I genuinely believe that the enemy uses guilt and condemnation to demoralize us in the place of prayer. So how can I overcome the accusations of the devil? How can I defeat the accuser of the brethren? The answer is simple. That is to put on the whole armor of God. But today we're going to look at two specific parts of the armor of God. Ephesians 6 introduces a metaphor that illustrates the reality of the spiritual battle that you and I face each and every day and describes the protection that God provides for us. So what are the components of the armor of God? First of all, Paul says, if you are going to defeat the devil, you've got to use the armor by putting on the girdle of truth. Now, the Roman soldier wore a tunic and in order to keep this tunic from getting in his way, he wore a girdle and he would have this girdle around his waist to tie everything together. Now in the Christian life, our girdle is of truth and the girdle of truth represents the truth of the word of God controlling our lives. When we wake up in the morning, the first thing we should reach for is the word of God and let the word of God get into our lives. Truth is what gives our armor security and strength. Remember that the God of this world is the father of lies. And as you are living on this earth, as a child of God, it is imperative you put on the girdle of truth each and every day. If I, as a child of God, am questioning God's word, if I am not believing God's word, if I haven't taken all of God's word and applied it, then Satan is going to get the victory. The girdle of truth simply means the application of God's word to my life. Satan is the liar, and if my loins aren't girded with truth, I am going to believe his lies. It is important that we immerse ourselves in scripture and we apply the truth in our lives. Now having put on the girdle of truth, which is the word of God, the next step is to put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is for the front and for the back. This piece of the armor protected vital organs in the heat of the battle. The righteousness is not our righteousness. Isaiah 64 verse 6, all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. It has nothing to do with our own righteousness. It is to do with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which we receive when we are saved. Our righteousness now comes from us believing in the completed works of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. You see, Satan wants to come to you and me and say, you did that, you did this. You shouldn't pray anymore. God doesn't love a sinner like you. Just give up. You deserve everything you're going through because of what you've done. Why are you going to pray to God? He doesn't listen to people like you. Just give up. We have on the breastplate of righteousness. And when he accuses us, the righteousness of Christ answers him. There are a lot of Christians that are listening to me right now that are being defeated by the accusations of the devil. You are trying to pray and all of a sudden the enemy attacks your mind and raises accusations and says, what right do you have praying to God? 
do you think God will listen to you after all the sins you have committed? The sins you committed before you came to Christ and the sins that you've committed since you've been a child of God. What right do you have to pray? Remember when you did this with her? Remember when you did that with him? Remember when you lied about that? If you listen to the accuser, he will defeat you. Stand your ground. When these thoughts come to your mind, remind yourself and the accuser, I am not wearing my own righteousness. I am wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When Satan comes to you as the accuser, the only way you can fight him is simply by not getting into the fight. You have to stand out of the way and let the righteousness of Christ deal with him. All you have to do is put on the, the breastplate of righteousness and remind yourself and the accuser, I am not wearing my own righteousness. I am wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then continue on praying. Continue on serving the Lord. Satan won't be able to respond to this because he cannot fault the perfect sinless life of Jesus. I believe that one of the greatest tactics to stop believers to pray is when he comes to us as the accuser. Put the breastplate of righteousness on. God will hear your prayer. God will use you in a great and mighty way. Don't listen to the accuser. You see, when he comes to me as the deceiver, he meets the girdle of truth, which is the word of God. When he comes to me as the accuser, he meets the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil is looking for every means, every way possible to enter every area of our lives. He is after your marriage. He is after your home. He is after your children. He is after your finances. He is after your joy. Don't be naive and think that the devil is only after your spiritual life. Don't think the devil is only after some parts of our lives. He is also after the smallest things in our lives. That is why we must resist him. There are different ways to resist the devil. We can use the word of God just like Jesus did in the Bible when he was tempted by the devil. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted, but he stood his ground and spoke the word of God to the devil. If we read the passage of scripture where Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, we see that the devil is not devoid of the word of God. He knows everything about the word of God. This is to let us know that we must know who we are dealing with here. It is the devil, the master of deceit. He can speak the word of God to deceive people. We must know that we are not dealing with a man. It is the devil. We can also pray to resist the devil. Prayer is a great key that opens all doors. Prayer can be used to resist the devil in all ways. Humility can help us to resist the devil too. When we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will be able to resist the devil because we will not raise ourselves above God. James 4 verse 7 Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All of these mentioned are the top ways we can resist the devil. But the main message in this sermon is, what areas of our lives should we resist the devil? We need to know how to resist the devil in different areas of our lives. There are some important parts of our lives that the devil will likely attack, and we are going to learn how to defend ourselves today. Number one, the devil will attack your home. How do you resist the devil in our homes? We all need this message at a time like this. If your home is in perfect shape, you need to take this message seriously. And if it is not, you must take it seriously too. The devil always wants to attack your home. We have seen many families that have scattered because of the attack of the devil that was successful. People think that all Christians have perfect homes. The kids are doing well, the father is doing okay, and the wife is great. But deep down, nothing is working. The family is scattered. Is your home like this too? To the outside world, does everything look perfect? But behind closed doors, nothing is working. Even if you are a single Christian, without a spouse or a partner, the devil is after your home. 
He doesn't want you to have peace. Do you want to tell the devil that enough is enough and resist him? Do you want to stop him from causing further harm in your home? If you don't stop him now and you don't resist him now, he will destroy your home and leave a permanent mark. I would also like to talk to people who are currently having that perfect home. Do you think that the devil will not attack? Do you think that you are standing perfectly well that the devil will not attack? You must be on guard. He is watching and waiting and you have to be ready. Please be ready. You might think that all is going well with you and your wife, but what about the children? What if the devil sees that you are too strong to attack? He goes for your spouse. If he finds that your spouse is too strong too, he goes for your children. Are you teaching your children the way of Christ? Are you empowering your children? What should you do to resist the devil or how do you resist the devil? These things I will be mentioning are practical ways to resist them. You must practice it with your heart. Firstly, allow Christ into your home. Some people think they've got it all under control. They think they have the power to take care of everything. I know you have Christ in your life. I know you might be born again. But have you once asked for Christ to take over your home? Have you allowed him to drive your home? Or do you always feel you have to have the control? Let Jesus take over and rest. If Jesus is in your family, I wonder how the devil will be able to gain access. I must tell you, it is not enough to allow Jesus in your home. You may allow him and then you don't make him the bedrock of the family. It is possible to accept someone into your house and then not give them attention or not allow them to do anything. If you ask Jesus to come in and you don't build on him when the storm comes, how will your home stand? Remember that Jesus was in the boat with his disciples when the storm came. The storm did not go until they called upon Jesus. When situations arise, go to the bedrock of your home, Jesus Christ, and call upon him. Jesus is not the last option when all has failed. Secondly, to resist the devil, you need to teach your children the way of Christ. Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If your children are on the right path, if they are following the ways of Christ, the devil will never have power over them. That is how to resist him. Teach your children so that he doesn't get to your home through them. Let them be powerful. Let them be too hot for the enemies to touch. They are not too small. Samuel was young when God called him. 2. How to resist the devil in your marriage the original plan of God is not that marriages should be broken. The devil is breaking up marriages these days and it seems to be normal. People just get divorced for small reasons. I heard someone who divorced her husband because he was too cautious, so she tagged him as boring. Are you serious? We think these things happen in unbelievers' homes alone, but it happens in Christian marriages too. Christians are breaking up the marriage because they could not cope anymore. This is no doubt the work of the devil. How do you resist the devil in your marriage? Firstly, love your spouse genuinely. Ephesians 5 verse 25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husband, loving your wife is not a choice. It is not a choice, guys. It is a command. Buy her some flowers. Take her out to eat. Tell her you love her. Tell her she's beautiful. Husbands, do you know if you are not considerate to your wife, the Bible tells us that you are hindering your own prayers. 1 Peter 3 verse 7 You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. There the verse continues on to say that your prayers will not be hindered. Also, Wives, love your husbands. Oh, but the spark is gone. Love them until it comes back. Go dating again from time to time. Send text messages in the middle of your tight schedule. Give up other less important things to be with your partner. Buy them gifts. Keep the love growing. The only reason why the bond between you and your partner will keep getting stronger as you age 
is your decision to remain deliberate about loving one another. Never get too used to your partner. Don't slide into that roommate status. In your speech and actions, let them know that they are the most important person in your life. Let them know they come second only to your relationship with the Lord. Do things together again. See a movie together. Go shopping together. Prayer The strength of a believer lies in his or her prayer life. The strength of a marriage lies in the prayer power of the partners involved. As much as it is essential to have your personal time with God, it is also necessary for you to pray together as a couple. Prayer strengthens your bond of love, friendship and trust. Prayer puts you both in your most vulnerable state as you pour out your heart to your Maker. This makes you realize how much you need each other. Make daily prayer a habit as a couple, no matter how short. Praying together helps you recognize the personal challenges your partner may be facing and helps you both to fight it in the most effective way. You can take charge of the situations in your home as you agree in prayers. Also, prayer is a sure way to deal with or resolve conflict. As a couple, you will struggle to go before God if you two are on bad terms or in conflict. Making prayer a daily part of your life will cause both of you as a couple to resolve conflict. Apart from the fact that prayer helps you control your home from the spirit realm, it also builds intimacy between you and your partner. The more you pray with or for somebody, the stronger the bond between you. This is why prayer partners share an unexplainable kind of love. Make your spouse your prayer partner. It's difficult to remain angry with somebody you have to pray with. Prayer helps you to quickly get over your clashes and trust God to help you live together as one. John 15 verse 13 Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The kind of love that we are talking about is the kind that Christ has for us. If there is genuine love between the two of you, there will be no way for the enemy to get into you. You must love your spouse. It is a command in the Bible. Ephesians 5 verse 25 and 1 Peter 4 verse 8 don't underestimate the power of genuine love. Secondly, run from adultery. Another thing that the devil uses to destroy a marriage is adultery. You see, the husband has extramarital affairs with different women. You see the wife doing the same thing and they will claim that they still love each other. What kind of love is that? The number one way that the devil gets a marriage is through sexual immorality. When there is an appearance of sexual immorality, you know that you must run. Joseph's dream could have been destroyed if he had slept with his master's wife. So, how to resist the devil in your finances? The devil is on the move to steal, kill and destroy. And one of the areas he wants to steal is your finances. God says that he has a good plan for us, and I am sure the plan is not to make us poor. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 there are times you have money with you and before you know it, the money is gone, but you cannot point out what you use the money to do. This has been happening to many people. Christians are not left out of this. You need to know how to resist the devil in your finances. He is out there to attack your businesses. He is there to attack your job. He wants to block the source of your income and you can't allow him to do so. You must resist him. What do you do to resist him? Firstly, pray hard. You can have money now and notice that sickness comes from nowhere and your money is gone. Do you think that is natural? You never have a breakthrough. Do you think that is normal? That is the devil attacking your finance. You can be very careful with the way you spend your money, but if you don't pray and pray hard, the devil will keep pushing situations in your life that keep you below the plan of God for your life. Secondly, avoid sexual immorality. What I am saying is to avoid adultery or sexual immorality. As a man, you must avoid it. As a woman, you must avoid it. It is not limited to gender. What I will say is, what can make a billionaire become a millionaire is sexual immorality. 
people love to spend unnecessarily just to satisfy their sexual desires. Sexual immorality is a sin, and it will make someone poor. As a Christian, run from this. If you run, you are resisting the devil. Sexual immorality will literally steal money from your pocket. Time and energy you could use on building your business or earning more, you are spending it on satisfying your sexual desires. Watching unholy things on the computer for hours at a time, hiding stuff, driving around to commit fornication and adultery, when you could put that energy into your future. 3. Plan and follow the plan. Luke 14 verse 28 For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Planning helps. It helps you to know how to spend, what to spend on, and what not to spend on. If you have no plan, you are giving the devil the chance to attack your finance. Always plan and follow the plan. And avoid laziness. Too much sleeping makes you weak, and too much sleeping is caused by laziness. The Bible talked against sleeping too much because it will result in poverty. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 33 to 34. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. All of these are the dangers of becoming lazy, they are the effects of laziness on our personal lives. How to Strengthen Your Spirit Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23-24 through 24 of the King James Version says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The spirit of a person is something that must be taken care of and make sure that it doesn't die. We cannot afford to be weak in spirit at a time like this. This is the time to be strong in spirit. Many Christians take time to care for the body instead of looking deep at what is inside of them, their spirits. Yes, look after your physical body, but look after your spiritual body even more so. That is the spirit you will have forever. God will one day give you a new physical body. When we give our lives to Christ, we experience a change. The change that we experience involves death and resurrection. Our old self is put to death and we are raised again in Christ. The spirit is reborn. The old spirit that is weak, the old spirit that has been corrupted is gone. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Going through this process, we have a new spirit in us. When the new spirit is in us, what we have to do now is to strengthen the spirit. There are many things that we can do to strengthen the new spirit in us that we have been given through Christ. We must know that the fact we have been given a new spirit doesn't mean that the spirit is already strong and doesn't need to be strengthened. It's like planting a seed. If you refuse to water it, it will not grow. The new spirit in us needs to grow. It wants to come out strong and keep growing stronger. David prayed to God that he gives him a clean heart and a new spirit. That new spirit that he prayed for must be taken care of. It must be strengthened. I would like to share with you what will happen to you if you refuse to strengthen your spirit. Firstly, you will be easy prey for the devil. You must have read in the Bible that the devil is going about looking for whom to destroy and kill. The people that he will destroy are those that are weak in spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13 of the New International Version says, Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. You must be strong in spirit. You must strengthen your spirit. Don't act like you don't care. The devil is always going about looking for someone to attack and destroy. You don't want to be his victim. You must be strong in spirit. If you have been weak before and you are allowing the devil to make fun of you or to make you look like a fool, you have to rise now and stand against him in strength that comes from God. To put it simply, if you don't strengthen your spirit, the devil will push you around and influence aspects of your life. But you, as a child of God, 
need to be able to stand your ground and not allow yourself to be pushed around. Secondly, you will be tossed around. People who are weak in spirit are easily tossed around. A man who went to church became sick. He was afraid of dying. His friends, who were not believers, started giving him options. Some advised him to go to people who could heal him, people who worshipped idols. He did this and it didn't work. His friend also advised him to join occult groups. He did and it didn't work. All the different advice he received, he followed it. This man had weak spirit and he was easily tossed around. Those that are strong in spirit will stand their ground. You see Christians being easily deceived by people because they are unable to discern the true spirit. They can't test spirits and discern the true ones. You know there are false prophets in the world today. They have gone out to deceive many people. You cannot afford to be weak. You have to strengthen your spirit. You need to be able to discern them. Thirdly, your faith will be weak. You need to strengthen your spirit before you can build strong faith in God. It is your spirit that will enhance your faith in God. Everything that we do in the Christian life is based on faith. You have to teach your spirit to believe in God. Fourthly, you will not be able to worship God in truth. John chapter 4 verses 23 through 24 says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Christians claim to worship God, but their spirit is not connected to God, and they believe that is true worship. You cannot worship God in your body. You have to connect your spirit to him. You need a strong spirit to be able to overcome the flesh and all the thoughts in you and connect with God. God is a spirit. You cannot go to worship who is a spirit in flesh. Your flesh will not carry you to him. This is why you as a Christian must know how to strengthen your spirit. It is important in this time we are in. We cannot be disconnected from God. When we pray, we need to be in spirit and close our minds to every distraction that can disconnect us from God. What are the things that we need to do to strengthen our spirit? Well, firstly, accept Christ. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What Jesus is telling us here is that he will come to live in us. He will be with us in spirit. If Jesus is with us in spirit, that means he will strengthen our spirit. We don't have the power to strengthen our spirit ourselves. We can only do the things that will let God strengthen our spirit for us. And accepting Jesus is part of what we should do. Do you want to be strong in spirit? Do you want to say enough is enough to the devil tossing you around? Are you tired of the devil in ruining your marriage, ruining your finances, your joy, peace, and security? You must accept Christ in you. Secondly, we can ask for more of the Holy Spirit and remove all barriers for the Holy Spirit to work in your life. One of the things that the Holy Spirit will give you is power. There is no way you will have the Holy Spirit of God in you and you will remain weak. The Holy Spirit will give you strength. Without the Holy Spirit, it will be hard to get by daily. We need him. The Holy Spirit tells you things that are going to happen. The secret things that are yet to be revealed will be revealed to you. When the devil wants to attack you, the Holy Spirit tells you what to do. That is how you become strong in the Spirit. One of the promises of Jesus about the Holy Spirit is that he will give you power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When the time of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit came with power and strengthened their spirits. With this strength in them, they were able to preach without fear in them. Are you still living with fear in you? Fear of the future? Fear of tomorrow? That means there are areas of your life where the Holy Spirit is not in. Yield to him. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Third, eat the word of God. The word of God is food for the spirit. Just like we eat to strengthen our body, we need spiritual food to strengthen our spirit too. And that is the word of God. Jesus said that we must not only live by food always because the word of God is important too. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 of the King James Version says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When we give our lives to Christ, we are born again. We become a new creature. At this time, we are babies in Christ. We must start to feed on spiritual things that will make us grow. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 of the New International Version says, Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Fourth, ask for the strength. We need to learn to ask for strength from God. We need the strength of God to keep moving in this world. Things happening around us can make us go weak. They can drain our strength spiritually. But we must run to God and ask for his strength. The strength of God will make us go through anything. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 of the King James Version says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. This is the time for us to pray the prayers of David. We must ask God to create in us a clean heart. A new spirit must be given to us. We cannot be going around weak showing the devil that we are available to be consumed. The enemy must see the strength in us and run. We must pray to God for a new spirit. Psalm 51 verse 10 of the King James Version says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me.